So United went away at home against Everton the other day, right over the weekend. Got some time to kind of mull over the results, watch the game back, watch extended highlights, cover and watch some obviously match reviews and analysis and all that malarkey. And I'd want to provide some of my thoughts on the game and what I think lies ahead for United and Oli Gunnar Solskjaer. So, um, as per usual, start with the lineup. Um, of course. Lineup, I wasn't necessarily looking or awaiting any big surprises. I knew most likely to not win. However, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's job is at the line. He always seems to go for his tried and tested and the players he knows he can trust in terms of getting a performance in. So the back five sort of picks itself. They haven't necessarily let him down in any way, shape or form, apart from some rare moments of calamitous decision making from Maguire, Lindelof or De Gea. Mostly, they've, pretty been, they've, they've been quite solid with their performances so that picks itself and in the midfield was the interesting part where he essentially went for a 4-4-2 I'm gonna say where he had Freddie McTominay playing in center midfield with Rashford and Mata providing a width and obviously covering um for the fullbacks too and Bruno Fernandes playing behind Marshall who's basically playing up front on his own after his suspension going back into the team and um it worked I'm gonna be honest it worked for the first like obviously we conceded a goal very early on um with Bernard um getting on the end of a pretty decent knockdown which I felt it was going to be spelling trouble I think that's how they scored right a, a massive Pickford um goal kick again he can't save pretty well he's pretty erratic um and he can't catch but when it comes to using his feet right he can kick the ball really really far he kind of gets it right up until just outside the area um Calvert Lewin smartly comes on the right hand side, which is where Lindelof was, um, challenges him in the air, wins it very easily, knocks it down to Bernard. Bernard gets the ball, and like all great Brazilians do, he has that knack of just getting the ball on the ground, a couple of dummies, and hitting it on like the half dummy. So whenever you think he's going to faint one more time, he hits it. That's what most great Brazilian attacking midfielders really do. A great way of catching out the goalkeeper. And he sort of catches Because I think any other time, I think De Gea probably saves that. But I think the dummy's stepping inside. Um, obviously, Aaron Wan-Bissaka being right in front of his eye line. And obviously, you know, Wan-Bissaka being very good adept at blocking shots with his feet. He was able just to sneak it under and then they were winning 1-0. But I think we responded pretty well after that. We got a goal pretty soon after. I think about 10 minutes after I think that actually happened. Is it 10 minutes or so? Ba -ba 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 yeah, about 10 minutes, yeah. Just under five. Bruno Fender scores a header. Um, he played pretty well. He had a bit of a maverick performance in terms of just really trying to push things. Um, I'm still not a fan of his kind of you know, balls around the corner, flicks and one-touch balls. The killer balls are sort of on a split the defence. I think he kind of relies on that way too much in the similar sense that Gerard did before. Gerard Julia came into Liverpool. He had a tendency of always playing the Hollywood ball and not necessarily needed that often. But I thought he responded pretty well and really helped to inspire the team so much so with the finish as well for the first goal, bullet header into the bottom corner, really kind of um, G'd everybody up and a rare, very, very rare assist from Luke Shaw. Um, what difference it makes to just sign a quality left back in Alex Tellers, a player that's probably doing a lot of good stuff in training because, you know, Luke Shaw's performance levels have really improved since we've signed Alex Tellers. So I'm sure even with coronavirus, Tellers have looked phenomenal in training. We obviously saw what he did when he came, when he had a little cameo or his only appearance for us against PSG. He played phenomenal. Um, some of those crossing on set pieces in, a, in open play just really kind of, you know, made your mouth water. So I'm sure Luke Shaw has seen that. And he's like, you know what? I can't risk this because, you know, I think he's very aware that much like Solskjaer, if he ends up leaving United, he's up options you know there's only way for him is down there's no way he's going to be signing for another top six club after he leaves united that's for sure or you know it, it could always change but i very much doubt it so we're seeing a lot of better performances in luke shaw and that cross in for bruno fernandez was brilliant he actually was crossed in there with intention crossed in there with purpose into a space bruno fernandez attacks it bam one one and then we kind of got better control of the game after that I thought the shape of our team was a lot better. Uh, Bruno Fernandes and Scott McTominay were imperious in the middle of the park. They really dominated that midfield. They bullied uh, Decore and Alan for the most part. Even Sigurdsson had a really quiet game. We kept James Rodriguez um, significantly quiet. Bernardo was probably the most liveliest out of the entire attacking front six, I'd say, of this Everton side. Um, they obviously missed a lot with, that, with having Richarlison out of the team. He definitely adds a little bit of a... Um, 
another dimension to their attacks. I think, unfortunately, with the players they have available, they just can't, you know, split teams open as they would like. And I think they did play a bit into our tactics. They didn't really pressure us too much onto the ball. They allowed Lindelof and Maguire to have the ball comfortably. Scott McTominay was pinging balls out to the wings really nilly. And most of the time, Scott Mc, that's not really Scott McTominay's repertoire. He usually does that very easily when he has time on the ball. Like most players, I think if you don't give them time, um, that's where you definitely see the de difference in qualities in players, right? If they get impressed by very good defenders and able to wriggle out and still find a ball, that's a mark of a very top player. But if you're doubting your ability or a bit limited, you want, you know, to take as much touches as possible so you don't make a mistake. The fact that Matomini was whipping, you know, spreading the balls out left, right and centre goes to show just how much they set back off us, which probably allowed us to get control of the game. We end up score obviously 1-1, one, one, a couple of chances here and there, one from our show that he probably should have scored. Second half starts off much the same. Rashford probably should have scored a goal. Uh, he ends up fluffing his nines and missing that. And then, oh no, sorry, we, we end up going in 2 1, I think, before the break, actually. I'm pretty sure um, it's Bruno Fernandes again. He chips the ball into the box. My, uh, Rashford sort of glance headers it, but it does go in the bottom corner anyway. Well deserved got, um, lead for us, I think, with the balance of the game. And in second half, much the same, too. We limited um, the chances that um, Everton were basically exposed to even look here in the stats we had 13 shots to Everton 7 uh, 5 shots on target to Everton's 1 45% possession less than Everton actually but I think we had um, I'm going to say they had probably some chances um, Luca Dean probably should have crossed the ball in second half to Calvert-Lewin there was definitely a chance there no that was first half sorry definitely a chance there for him to score in that regards but I think we controlled large parts of that game without doing much to really control it. Um, again, I think our midfield definitely won that game for us. So credit to Solskjaer for picking Rectomini and Fred. But ultimately, we're still 14th in the league. And I think that form there, a win, a loss, a draw, a win, a loss, definitely shows you where we are as a team and how much work definitely needs to be done in order to get us back where we need to be. And I think ultimately that's what's going to end up costing um oh we some matches there. So yeah, so it's um loss, win, draw, loss, win. That's definitely what's going to end up costing Solskjaer his job in the end. This inconsistent form, the the favoritism with the players that cause I look back at that lineup, I think yeah we won, great. I still think this is probably the best formation, regardless of players. But there's a part of me that thinks there should be an there should be an aspect, you know, especially when you look at Van der Beek, right? He got taken off for what, sixtieth minute against Istanbul and the idea of, you know, and he played the best on the pitch. He didn't give the ball away hundred million times that like Bruno Fernandez did. He kept it neat and tidy. You can clearly see players enjoy playing with him because he's very quick and intentional with his passing, moves into space very intelligently, very versatile. Um, the fact that he didn't play at all in this game leads me to believe that most likely Solskjaer didn't sign him. He was definitely a player that was given to Solskjaer by the board because Van der Sar had a contact, because he came up for sale and we just signed him for the sake of it. Or maybe there was this, or maybe behind the scenes, the idea was that Pogba would move. But, you know, with COVID happening, um, it just never transpired. So instead of um, United losing the opportunity to sign Van der Beek now, they'd rather hold on to him, even if that meant him spending the best part of, you know, this entire season playing from the bench. It means that you have a player ready to ready and willing to step in to fill in the shoes of Paul Pogba or to fill in the kind of, you know, to be the person that can kind of come on uh, for him when needs be. But I would like to see a little bit more flexibility in that, if Bruno Fernandes doesn't play, then you allow Van der Beek to play in that number 10 position or Pogba. If if Marco Dutch doesn't play, you play uh, Pogba there instead. I just think sometimes this tendency to switch the system when different players come on or to make too many changes. I like the fact that he kept Freddie McTominay on. That really allowed us to see out the entire game without much incident, I think, towards the end. Whereas I think in the past, Solskjaer has done this thing where he'd take off Fred, put on Matic or take off both players and put on one cent defensive midfielder. There's some odds things here and there, which again are ultimately going to end up costing him his job. But I think sticking to this formation and sticking to the spine of the team, right? Where we see, you know, this kind of diamond here, or just the back, whatever. What is that? The back five, six, seven. Yeah? The back seven. Sticking to that back seven is probably the key to us actually doing things in this league especially considering how topsy-turvy it is there's definitely a room for us to challenge or to really you know to kind of you know shake um 
to kind of shake things up a little bit. We might obviously, of course, I'm not expecting us to win the league. I'm not expecting us to win a domestic trophy or even a European trophy. But I expect us to have a bit of a good run and build upon what we built upon last season. And that's essentially why I still think long term Solskjaer probably isn't the man for the job. Now, it's ironic that whenever we need a big result, he ends up pulling one out of his ass and the players have, you know, a lot to... They have a lot to answer for, but you also do have to give them a bit of credit for sticking up for their guy and performing when it needs to be. They could have easily retreated into their shells after, you know, going a goal behind against Everton away from home. A pretty well taken goal. It felt a bit ominous in that regard, but they sort of rolled their sleeves up collectively and kind of rallied around each other and eventually ended up getting the victory, which is a really, really big result considering we've got the international break coming up now. So we needed to go into that with a bit of a victory, but I'm still not convinced of Oli, man. I'm really not. And I think his press conference after his post-match interviews, um, the way he seemed rattled, complaining about a fixture pile-up, just seeing that somebody else under pressure. Now, I don't think the pressure, in my opinion, should be directed to him in this way. I think if the club has doubts about his ability to take this club to the next level or to do a good job, he should just be relieved of his duties regardless of our results. I don't think it's fair to have a manager... Um, a legend like himself be on such tender hooks waiting to see what happens game by game that's not how you want to you know a big club like United you should have a clear plan in mind now if the plan is to stick with him you need to come out and strongly categorically dismiss any rumors and say you've committed to seeing out this entire season with Solskjaer and you review things in the summer you just need to say that outright but the fact that they don't want to say that the fact that they're reluctant the fact that they're briefing members of the press about reaching out to Pochettino and other managers makes me to believe me to believe that eventually they'll end up firing and just looking for the perfect opportunity because as per usual United is mostly a PR machine as opposed to a football club so they don't want to be seen as the owners that let go of the you know, fired the babyface assassin, right? The guy that came in and sort of saved us from Mourinho and provided us that magical evening in Paris, right? They don't want to be seen to that people. And there's also a part of them that knows if they fire Solskjaer, they're going to have a lot to, con they're going to, they're going to have a lot to answer for in terms of um, whether or not Ed Woodward is the guy to take us forward to in that role as a chief executive. Why don't we have a football director? Are the Glazers bleeding the club dry? It's going to be too much attention brought towards the Glazers and what Edward was done at the club during their tenure. So if anything, they'd want Solskjaer to sort of write his own ticket, perform really, really badly, um, you know, uh, manage over a really bad form of games and then get someone else in because it'll be the perfect excuse to say, hey, you see, we gave him everything they needed, you know, maybe, maybe not everything, but we gave him as much as we could and he still hasn't done the job. I think that's probably what they're going to end up doing and I think that's probably the smartest decision to make. Again, do I like it? No. Um, do I still think Solskjaer needs to go? Probably yes, but he's not going to go anytime soon, especially if he keeps pulling out these results out of his ass. and for me, myself, as a United fan, I much prefer seeing us win than seeing us lose um, regardless of who's in charge you just can't take you know another weekend of ignoring match of the day and not watching any football because I don't want to be reminded of the score I'd rather us shit house I win me watch the highlights be able to support my club and talk about it in this kind of positive way but yeah United 3 Everton 1 happy with the victory